Hey, what's up, YouTube, and welcome back to more Gullen's Discussion. And it's been raining, and my arm's been hurting like hell for the past couple days on the road. And uh, I'm your host, Jeremy Murphy. Today I'm going to talk at you about some developments. We've had a couple of new studies that just came out in the Asian Journal of Engineering and Science, if I'm not mistaken, or Science and Engineering. And uh, these two studies are interesting. It's a closed source journal, which means you don't have open access to all of the data that's in each of these research papers. So you got to pay for it. And <sighs> hey, kitty cat. One of the first one, basically, what it says is that Morgellons is a condition that's associated with Lyme disease and spirochetes and the reason why they're making that distinction is because Lyme disease is a popular spirochete but spirochetes are typically stigmatized anyways because syphilis is also a oh shit I'm sorry guys syphilis is also a spirochete I gotta get a thing for the car on this I don't know what I can do I mean Maybe something pretty easy, but, uh, <laughs> all right, we'll figure it out. We'll get there at some point. But, uh, and so the spirochetes, they are, they are bacteria, but they're not really like bacteria. You know, there's some obvious differences between spirochetes and, you know, you're, you're right. When you think about bacteria, I think most people think about like that, uh, like oblong foot, uh, oval pill kind of shaped uh oh there's a train coming through in the rain the rain i like the rain but i mean it's cool but the rain's cool i mean i'm cool with the rain i've always been kind of cool with the rain it doesn't really bother me that bad to be honest with you you know when it's like freezing rain it's it's not that bad especially if i can get out and jog in it but jogging's not going to be happening anytime soon so that's out the window windows closed and the, the thingers are on not at full speed though so the spirochetes you know most people when they think about bacteria they think about that oblong pill shaped uh, oval you know with the little things coming off around it and uh, the you know the organelles inside of it the endoplasmic reticulum and all that jazz but spirochetes are different they're like little worms uh, they are little corkscrews and uh, they propel themselves with the outer flagella that wraps around itself and allows it to or provides it inertia to uh, invade tissues and even bone even bone when you look at the syphilis victims of the uh, 19th century the congenital patients they have bone deformities they have recesses in their in their bones because the virulence of the syphilis was capable to penetrate through that hard well it's porous I mean bones are porous so it's got pockets it can go into, and then from there it can just drill its way on in. But it's kind of like hammering home the point that spirochetes are pretty damn dangerous, and it's something that ought to be taken seriously. And there's enough evidence that Morgellons is associated with it, and that it's a real condition that it's worthy to be published in this peer-reviewed journal. The Asian, the Asian Journal of Engineering and Science is... It's a peer-reviewed journal. They, people, they have to go through a process to get their paper published in that. And it's, like I said, it's not open access. So while you do have access to the abstract, I haven't even read the full report myself. So I don't know. I've seen a lot of citations in that abstract, uh, including ones for papers that we probably don't appreciate as Morgellons patients. Uh, papers that are trying to dispute that Morgellons is an actual condition and that it's purely psychosomatic. So I'm curious to see 
why those were cited and how those sources were used in the research. Oh, fudge! I can't make it through here, so I gotta turn around. Every now and then I get real backed up and I gotta turn around. Crap. All right, but anyway. And that was the first of two papers published in that journal. The second one is a little bit more interesting. If you're one of those Morgellons patients that get tired of my bullshit whenever I tell you that there's nothing special about Morgellons. Now, personally, I did have an incident when I was a kid where I had a television that blew up in my face, basically. I was sitting there watching the cartoons as a kid, and then just, I, I heard it was like, and the TV blew up. My mom ran in from the kitchen and grabbed me, and, you know, I was okay, but it was still kind of one of those weird situations where it's like, you normally don't go from Tom and Jerry to... The TV explosion in your face. And it may have been Thundercats or something. No, I was younger than that. Because Thundercats didn't come out until the latest of the 80s. Uh, but wrap and wrap around to back what I was speaking about earlier before I got turned around and had to turn around. Uh, this second study that appeared in the Asian Journal of Science and Engineering, if I'm not screwing that up. Isn't that nice outside with the trees? I'm not screwing that up. The second one was about Morgellons patients being uh, or having magical properties. So what they're trying to say is that some bacteria have electric or EMF properties, which is true. And some bacteria communicate with uh, electrical nanowires. They produce these uh, routes of communication between the colonies. And those colonies communicate with these bacterial lines of communication that process electrical signals. So, what they're trying to say is that there may be a rational explanation to some of the reports that are anecdotes that Morgellons patients may share with their physician. You know, in my case, it was probably like a tube or a, I don't know, it was a capacitor or a, uh, you know, uh, maybe a voltage spike. Who knows? But for sure, it's less likely that the TV exploding had anything of significance to do with my skin condition. So, however, there are other patients who may have other experiences that could maybe be more in line with something that could be explained by electrical processes that occur on the microbial scale. You know, say for example, uh, somebody sees a spark coming off their skin. Who knows if it's possible that some bacterial or combination of bacterial species in their skin, because we do know that the, the body's inhabited by hundreds of thousands of microbial species, in, on, and around it. I think it's millions. But, uh, and some of these can have some strange properties. So, you know, maybe one day they were looking at the sore on their skin. They had a camera and they, they photographed a little, maybe it looked like a, a blue spark. You know, that could have been a reflection off the lens. But, I mean, if they drill down into it and they're like, there's no other possible explanation, and they do these tests that elicit this bacteria that is in them, you know, maybe it's a weird bacteria like, okay, for uh, Bonnie Bassler talks about the Vibrio fisheri, which produces the bioluminescence in the oceans, the blue glow in the oceans, that's the Vibrio fisheri. 
And so maybe, you know, uh, Morgellons patient just happens to be uh, a diver, you know, by profession. They go out and they hunt for mollusks or uh, crustaceans at night. And, ooh, wow, I haven't seen this area of town. Honestly, I'm, I'm kind of out here, but this reminds me a lot of the Grand Theft Auto. Greenville's looking more and more like Los Angeles every day. But, uh... So yeah, that's what this study's about. I'm gonna put a link to it in the description below, but it's talking about Morgellons patients may be harboring some bacteria with some electrical properties, which if really drilled down into by the physician and determined that there could possibly maybe be a potential link, it's just kind of a way to say these patients come in with a lot of strange symptoms. And if there is no further explanation, there may be evidence of a possible association uh, with a rare occurrence of some kind of cohabitation between the patient and this uh, bacteria with some electrical properties. That's all. That's what it's about, really. Again, this is another paper where you don't have access to the full the full data uh, just the abstract so you don't know how they arrived at this conclusion what conclusion they arrived to uh, well I mean he's due to an extent uh, in the abstract but it's not like you get to really see their thought processes behind putting this research to get wow there we go all right so the next thing I want to talk about is I got mentioned on Crystal Clear's show on Anchor FM, more Morgellons. I'll put a link to that in the description below and you guys can check it out. It's Crystal Clear on more Morgellons. I'm sorry. Man, I butchered that all the hell. More Morgellons. You guys should check out more Morgellons. I have a show on BitChute called More, or called uh, Morgellons Discussion. But that's what the soft G, Morgellons discussion. Crystal Clear show is more Morgellons on, wow, this is an old neighborhood. Oh, on Anchor FM. And so I'm going to put some links in there. But she was talking at people and encouraging them to go, oh, wow, that's a nice view. To go to the uh, MorgellonsSurvey.org and fill out the Morgellons survey because. We definitely need some more data in there, and uh, I'm going to be summarizing. I do have a uh, preliminary results of that survey on the website right now. If you go to morgellonsurvey.org and hit the blog, I've done a couple of stories since I published that one about the preliminary results. But you can take a look through the data yourself. Some of the questions I asked people were, what were some of the more common missed... Some of the more common diagnoses that you experienced, uh, like for example, Morgellons patients often get misdiagnosed with autoimmune disorders, eczema, uh, psychiatric conditions, and little regard is uh, paid for the actual potential that they may be having, uh, experiencing an infectious process. And it's that kind of marginalization for the potential that allows for patients to develop into these late stage scenarios. Bacterial infections, spirochetal in particular, have to be addressed early on, or the potential to eradicate them becomes less as you progress through life. And I'm telling you, man, progressing through life with an undiagnosed bacterial infection is no fun because you're getting hurt along the way, your body's just tearing up, your joints aren't strong. I mean, I started tearing tendons and stuff when I was young, you know, when I thought I was healthy, when I didn't realize that, you know, I, I can't get a pill and make this go away. This is something that's probably been going on since I was born. And if you have a bacterial infection when you're born and you don't get it addressed at birth, and it's just allowed to progress, then you're gonna, it increases the probability that you're gonna acquire more infections as you go along. That was one of the questions that I uh, we asked in the survey. Uh, another one that we, oh, I gotta check and see if I got a message here. Let me pause this thing for a second, guys.
Okay, no, we're good, we're good. Alright, so one thing also that I learned was that if if you got a camera, or if you got a phone with like a wide, you know, that 19 by 9 aspect ratio, make sure when you're filming in the car you put it back on 16 by 9 so you can get your end screens on the YouTubes. Alright, so on the Morgellon survey, there's eight questions, and then the ninth one is, what's your email address? Whoa, I got a weight limit on this bridge? Man, I probably shouldn't be on here. No, what are you following me for, man? No! Should go left or right? Let's go left. Alright. Wow, that's cool. Got the train on the tracks and everything. Oh no, he's behind me. Crap, where am I gonna go? Oh shit. Okay, oh good, I lost him. Alright, so. Thank you, Crystal Clear, for mentioning me on your show. More Morgulons on Anchor FM. Alright, and uh, so the next thing I wanted to talk about, oh, uh, the community gaslighting you about the potential for these bacterial infections. I wanted to talk about and elicit the most common things that I hear when I start talking about Lyme disease and the people, the potential that the people in my life have been misdiagnosed and the potential for them to have the same infection is being marginalized. And so the first argument you'll hear is, well, you're just trying to apply your disease to everybody else. You know, like you can't understand that there are other diseases. And that's not the case at all. The fact is that it's an infectious disease that I've got, okay? And it's not an infectious disease that is endemic to any one area. I'm in South Carolina. In 2008, Governor Mark Sanford designated May 2008 Lyme Disease Awareness Month because there is strong evidence that Lyme disease is in South Carolina and has existed in South Carolina for a very long time. That was in 2008 and there hasn't really been any kind of special initiatives to raise awareness, change the way the medical establishment operates, uh, or eradicate the potential for people to acquire this infection that doesn't discriminate. And so the potential for it, the incidence to have increased since that, since Governor Sanford's uh, designation is exponentially greater now um, was it 10 and uh, 13 years later 13 and a half years later so when I raise my concern it's because of my understanding that first of all a doctor can say no I don't think you have Lyme disease because Lyme disease is endemic to the northeastern United States you are in the south eastern United States and so Lyme disease is not here and thus you cannot have Lyme disease that's a mistake that's a mistake for a doctor to make to say that because it marginalizes the potential that it's true. And here's another thing. Lyme disease is one of these spirochetes that I was talking about. Uh, so there is the potential that the same patient could also have syphilis. More than likely, however, it's probable that they've got what I've got, the tick-borne relapsing fever. And you're going, well, Jeremy, what? You just said you had Lyme disease and you look like you got syphilis. Okay, and that's fair. But the fact is that tick-borne relapsing fever is a spirochete like Lyme disease and syphilis. There is no standard test for tick-borne relapsing fever. You're going, well, that's crazy. How can that be true? Find out for yourselves. I mean, seriously, take, ask your doctor. 
what about a tick-borne relapsing fever test to see what they tell you? Especially if you're here with me in South Carolina. This is a chill neighborhood. I like, what the hell are you putting leather couches outside for in the rain? Man. That's cool. I like that. All right, but anyways, uh, tick-borne relapsing fever. It's all right. So the ticks that carry Lyme disease. They're found typically on uh, the white-footed deer, uh, white-footed mouse, and the uh, uh, soft-tailed deer. If, I, if, I, if I'm not mistaken about that, and those are the natural. So that's where the ticks typically are thought to acquire the infection because they're natural reservoirs for the bacteria, and they don't suffer the debilitation. They don't often develop the Lyme disease syndrome like humans do when that bacteria is passed uh, from the tick's gut into our bloodstream, into our skin, rather. It's regurgitated as the tick feeds on us. And there is evidence that mosquitoes also carry the same spirochete, the same Lyme disease spirochete in Germany. And just to be clear, Germany is not geographically situated in the northeastern United States. I promise. So, tick-borne relapsing fever, however, the ticks, get this, the ticks that transmit that infection, which is very similar to Lyme disease and has been scientifically been demonstrated uh, to be associated with Morgellons as well at the same uh, interval or frequency that Lyme disease is demonstrated to be associated with the Morgellons condition. I know you've got that stop sign, so... Oh, no! The ticks, they don't, li they don't live on deers. They live in the walls of dilapidated environments in large urban areas. And even medium-sized urban areas like Greenville, South Carolina. I was living in a dilapidated environment, and these rodents, uh, like squirrels... And raccoons were living in the walls so the ticks that transmit tick-borne relapsing fever also live on dogs and they live in the walls so what they do that's different from Lyme disease ticks Lyme disease ticks you'll find the tick on you hanging on you like that sucker's not gonna leave he's like he's like it's it's endless buffet day you know and he's just like chilling out on you these suckers, the tick-borne relapsing fever ticks, they'll feed on you during the night and during the day, they'll detach and go crawl back into the wall and pretend nothing ever happened. And the kind of illness that people experience in the early stage of tick-borne relapsing fever is a different kind of illness that's been a different kind of experience that's been reported on patients who have contracted Lyme disease. Now to be clear, the body doesn't develop a natural immunity to the various strains of syphilis and it's hypothesized that in some people they don't ever develop the natural resistance or immunity to acquiring the various species of Lyme disease either. I don't know about the research of tick-borne relapsing fever. I haven't looked to see if there's anything on that. And so, if that's the case, then you can be born with syphilis, get big by ticks when you're staying at grandma and grandpa's house as a kid, uh, get bit by more ticks when you're staying in that dilapidated party house through college. Uh, pick up some tick-borne relapsing fever and some more syphilis along the way. And your body's just going to keep adding them on there, adding them on there. And see, this is a thing that people don't understand. 
I've often made the argument that people are just not competent to discuss the particulars about spirochetal infections because they're thinking again about that oblong shaped football si- uh, uh, the bacteria the, ov- the oval shaped pill shaped uh, bacterial cell they're thinking about that thing they're not thinking about the corkscrew shaped worm like drilling into the bones and the tissues but that's what Lyme disease is that's what syphilis is that's what tick borne relapsing fever is When tick-borne relapsing fever infects somebody in the initial stage, they have a cycle, like every three to six weeks, where they're vomiting, they're crapping themselves until they see the light. Every three to six weeks. And I went through that. And I walked into the emergency room one time. It was actually one of those, uh, what do you call it, emergency clinics that you should not go to when you break your leg break your leg do not go to a place that says emergency care or anything go to the hospital go to the emergency room okay I'm telling you this will save you some time you're gonna see all these clinics on the side of the road right next to the check cashing uh, uh, car advanced place car title advanced places and the vape lounges and the massage parlors Uh, but don't go to them you need to go to the hospital if you break a bone okay trust me on this all right so the thing is that what the hell was I talking about oh the vomiting and the seeing the light yeah I went into one of those emergency care clinics one time and my body temperature was so high that the nurse that was in there she was like wow it got really hot in this did you and she knew I couldn't turn the thermostat up or anything. So she had them turn the air up and I had her turn the light off because I was so sensitive to it. That's how badly this infection had invaded my central nervous system. I was, I mean, just lights were like too bright for me. Uh, typically, I even had a hard time driving before I got on the antibiotics. It's true. And so that's why I get so passionate about raising awareness for Morgellons and the associated infections because A, they are common to the area. Okay? They are endemic to every area in the planet. On the planet, if there's a place where you can live, there's probably some form of spirochetal infection. Whether it's, you know, coming from a person sexually transmissible, like the syphilis or the super gonorrheas, uh, or it's picked up by an insect that's, that is carried on an animal. Uh, or from the animal itself, like the Bartonella. You know, the tick-borne relapsing fevers, and yes, the Lyme disease is common. It's common, it's endemic. If you have a state in the United States, Lyme disease has been there. I don't know about Hawaii so much, but I know Alaska for sure. Alright, so, and people don't know this. They, they're thinking, you know, well, I mean, if this was a problem, then surely the, the doctors would know about it. The problem is that the information the doctors have been adhering to is outdated. If you go to the CDC website, they have a completely different story than what your doctor is saying if your doctor is telling you that Lyme disease is endemic to the northeastern United States and it's less likely that you would have it. If they're telling you that, then they just are not aware of what's currently on the CDC website. Currently. Half a million Americans each year are diagnosed and treated for Lyme disease. That's a lot of people every single year. And but the reason why it's increasing is not because, you know, these ticks are getting super smart and you know the it's because more doctors are becoming aware that oh okay. This is probably not an autoimmune disorder. Or this is not a psychiatric affliction. This is this is a bacterial infection. And a lot of people, when they get that test, the test will show the infection for them. It will not show the infection for a lot of people because that spirochetal bacteria in particular is very adept at preventing the immune system from developing those antibodies.
a lot of Lyme disease patients become, they may be immune competent to other infections. They may be able to fight off a cold or the chicken pox, but those spirochetal infections, they just stay in there. So people really need to understand that this is a problem that can directly, or is probably affecting them right now. And just because their doctors haven't said anything about it to this point, or have diagnosed them with an autoimmune or a psychiatric disorder, doesn't mean that the doctor was aware of the data that's available on the CDC website today about Lyme disease. And a lot of that comes down to how the states are mandating the educational requirements uh, for physicians, you know. Doctors, they have to be trained about the, these updates. They have to know that not only is Lyme disease a real possibility in their community, uh, but so are other infections as well. And they've probably always been here. So that's one of the arguments I hear, which is, well, you're just trying to apply your disease to everybody. The reason people say that is because that's the narrative, okay? If somebody comes up talking about Lyme disease, uh, they're just fixated on it, they're obsessed with it, they see it in everybody. That's not the case, okay? Not everybody has Lyme disease. But for sure, half a million Americans every year are being diagnosed and treated for it. And the reason why it deserves greater scrutiny and why more time should be and attention should be given to ruling out autoimmune and psychiatric disorders is because of the infection's ability to mimic those other conditions. out of this neighborhood all right so doctors I think nowadays are becoming more aware that it's it is likely that even though they're in like South Carolina or Georgia that if this patient has some kind of strange treatment resistant for a long time conditions that it may actually be in, associated with this common infection that is capable of mimicking the exact condition that the treatment is resistant for. But in order to get across the finish line, we have to raise a lot more awareness. So. I know that it's aggravating, believe me, I know it's aggravating when people marginalize the potential that you're experiencing an infection, but they're also, their behavior is erratic and unstable, and, but they won't look at the potential that they may be experiencing the same infection. And so you got to kind of deal with that on the way, on the road to get yourself to recovery. And so it's not going to happen as long as society maintains the view that Lyme disease is a rare affliction. It's not. It's especially common. Going all the way back to ancient Italy, uh, even to mosquitoes encased in amber. You know, we have evidence that Borrelia... Uh, spirochetal infections have been afflicting man and animal for millions of years and so we just have to come to terms it's really just a way of thinking like I said it goes back to that single cell bacterial that people have in mind when when they think about infections you know they think okay the antibiotics are gonna pop them and then that's it the person's cured they're not thinking that there's these reserves of these bacteria that have drilled into their bones that can replenish themselves once the blood is clear because of that short-term antibiotic treatment. 
they're not thinking that after that steroid wears off, then the immune system is going to be compromised, and that gives those infections, which are opportunistic, that opportunity to advance and progress through the body and achieve, you know, a greater number so that at some point they can they can have a quorum, they can establish a quorum on virulence. And that's when the person just drops dead, you know, they have the heart attack and that's it. They're no longer making YouTube videos. So I'd like to avoid that scenario, but I need a lot more assistance, especially financially from the community. I can't afford to pay for this, you know? I mean, yeah, I do make websites and I make some good websites. Uh, and I do the voiceovers, but you gotta feel like doing either, you know? You can't be walking around sore and um, broke because you spent all your money on all these supplements that the doctor recommended, which the insurance company, I feel, ought to be covering. Especially if you end up in a late stage scenario. If you end up with a late, in a late stage scenario with evidence of spirochetal infection, I think that the insurance ought to definitely help you with the supplements that you're going to need to offset a lot of the side effects that you're going to experience from the debilitation of the infection itself, but also the antibiotic treatments that you're going to have to take to try to eradicate it to prevent even further damage. And then there's the damage that the infection's already caused by being allowed to perpetuate inside your system for decades that's a disaster I mean you know I wish I wasn't here at this point where I'm 44 I'll be 45 in a few months and for the first time in my life I feel like I'm not an impediment I'm not an impedance to my own prosperity you know I used to feel like I get a lot of opportunities and people would point this out they're like, why do you shoot yourself in the foot? You know, you, we're trying to give you these opportunities. And it's just like, you have them right in the palm of your hands. And then you lose them. You're a loser. People give you these opportunities. And you just can't step through that door. And what it was, was I was, I was shooting myself in the foot. Because I didn't have the mental capacity, you know, to, to go forward. You know, to, with that cooperative effort, it was really all about cooperation. Yeah, I don't know what it is about these infections in particular that make you less cooperative and more, you know, lone rangery, but you'll have a problem with, even on a basic level, business relationships. But when it comes to actual, you know, interpersonal relationships, you can forget that because a lot of times, and maybe it's not just the, there, there's also some uh, traumatic events that people experience which will put them in this state for the rest of their lives. But you're fighting with your significant other. It's not just that there's any reason to, except that you're so used to fighting yourself, mentally and physically. It's real hard to go to sleep at night when your shoulder's been hurting for the past three and a half years, you know, and you're afraid to get it fixed because of the infection, because of the potential that after you come out of that surgery, whatever corrective measures had to be accomplished gives the infection further opportunity to progress. And when you're already in a late stage scenario, you really can't afford to give it any more room to advance so it's very troublesome it's very expensive and it's very hard to manage when you don't have the community support and it's unfortunate but the community is just not competent to support you with Lyme disease and if you got more gallons I mean I feel sorry for you because I know what it's like to have people go man if this guy just got on some antipsychotics and Start seeing a good psychiatrist, and skin would probably clear up. That's just misunderstanding on their part. The research is very clear. And I have very clearly provided evidence that I have that condition. 
The Borgella's condition isn't special, but boy, it sure is misunderstood, and it hurts. It hurts. The fibers themselves don't hurt, but the skin, the ulcerations, and then the pores filling up with the chunks of collagen. And then finally, people not understanding it, that hurts. At the end of the day, you add all that stuff up together and you're like, man, this is a tough way to live. It's not easy. So that's why, you know, I try to keep a positive mental attitude because if I got real down on the fact that this, you know, this is the way it, the way it is, and if I started to feel like things were never going to change and that nothing I did really mattered, and it's real easy to feel that way, especially without the community support, then, you know, I don't know what I would do. I don't know if I'd give up, but I could definitely understand why some people would feel that way. Definitely. What do you guys think? Let me know. Leave a comment down below. I appreciate being able to drive around town with y'all. I just had to get out of the house for a minute. And uh, so I'm going to take this back home and chop it up in the editor. Throw it up on the YouTube. If you could, please give this video a like. Hit that share button. Share it out with your friends. We're trying to get more on Reddit for sure. But also if you're on Twitter, and especially on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, please help us out. And uh, leave a comment down below. I love talking with you guys about the Morgellons disease. I definitely think we're starting to make some progress on coming together as a community. Being able to get the facts straight now. We're starting to get everybody on board that the facts are... Universally, the fact that we can all agree on is that Morgellons is a condition where filaments embedded in skin tissue. And I know that's upsetting for people who want to believe that there's a non-fibrous version of Morgellons, but there's not. And so I'm glad to see the community coming together and rejecting that notion. But once we all get on board about all the facts, then we're going to be able to stand together... And to enact real change within our communities. So let me know what you think about that. Also, like I said, I've been hurting for the cash. So if you can help me out with the donation, I'll leave my PayPal link in the description below, as well as the donate page on my website, morgellonsurvey.org. Once again, if you guys haven't checked out Crystal Clear at More Morgellons on Anchor FM, gonna leave you a link in the description to her latest episode. And I hope y'all are doing good. I mean, we're getting close to the weekend. It's free Epic Game Thursday on the game store. And, uh, you know, the rain, it's its here. So that means it's going to go away. And we're going to have some clear skies. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give way as, as this passes its way through. All right. Had a great time. And I hope to talk with you guys soon. Take care.